Welcome to Talking Giants presented by DraftKings. I'm your host, Bobby Skinner, here with my co-host, Justin Pennick. A lot to get to today. The Judge Gettleman Pressers, Leonard Williams tagged, Kyle O'Brien hired, um, Levine Toilolo restructured, Cody Core cut. We've got a good amount of news. That's why we did three episodes this week. Justin, what's going on, my man? Oh, Bobby Skinner, so, so much to get to. I- I'm overwhelmed. I'm overwhelmed, you know, kind of in life, but also just with looking at the Giants, analyzing the Giants, you know, what we do, I put that in quotes. Looking at the Giants, talking about the Giants, we definitely do that. I'm overwhelmed right now as a fan, and we'll kind of get to that when we talk about the the Judge and Gettleman pressers and kind of just maybe some of our overall thoughts before we get to specific nuggets. I'm overwhelmed. Free agency's coming up, and I can imagine the Giants' uh, front office is also overwhelmed by all of the unforeseen things that are happening right now in the NFL. I think free agency is so much more stressful than the draft. To me, the draft is basically just picking players. <laughs> free agency, it's like, even if you love a guy, it's like, well, his contract and his A, it's like, with the draft, it's like, you just draft guy. It's like, you, you like this guy, he's out of position of need, you get him. Um, yeah. So I, I really like the, I'm, I'm so ready for it to be April 1st and be officially draft month. And I will, I will have so much more fun. Um, but Justin, people who are having fun, you mm-hmm. want to know who they are? Mike? misc uh i don't think his real last name is misc but we'll call him mike miscellaneous how about that mm. Dwayne mason i always think of um Dwayne bacon who's that he's um a small any, forward he's an nba any, player any relation to uh, kevin bacon nope he plays in the nba and he's black not white oh um kyle girdwood <laughs> girthwood how about Ooh, that yeah change it to girthwood tough um, and then Darren, uh, I'm, I'm assuming it's Faria, 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 for real, for Rizzle, Darren, for real, Darren Rovell. How about that? No, you don't want to be Darren Rovell. No. Is Darren no. Rovell the most universally unlike person who is not like a bad person? I need you to explain that to me a little slower. Nobody likes Darren Rovell, even though he's not like, he's not like a bad person. He's just really like weird. Like, do you remember when he posted like JFK getting shot, like like the full graphic video of it on Twitter? No, where Jackie was picking up the brains. They literally like it's it was the anniversary of it, and Dan Ravel just posted the video of it just happening, like no warning, no, nothing. Anyways, did he uh, did he play in the uh, like NBA celebrity All Star game once? Probably. Because he, I, I, I just name searched him on the internet, and one of the pictures that comes up immediately is him in a basketball uniform, and he looks very out of place. No, it's probably him at the Hawks game for a halftime um, uh, show. Still, Justin, looks, who are these people that aren't Dan Ravel? Who people they we like these people. Still looks very out of place, but these people are not out of place because they went to patreoncom slash talking giants um bobby we're gonna have some exciting episodes where you definitely want to be in this live chat like there is no other place that you want to be after the giants sign a free agent or after they sign an underwhelming free agent than this patreon chat because not only do you get to hang out with us and talk with us you get to hang out with you know 170 other very diehard giants fans um who are subscribed to us for two dollars a month and they support us and they also get to listen and watch the shows live before everybody else. Patreon.com slash Talking Giants. Thank you to everybody. We love you. All right, Justin. We're going to start with the pressers. Um, Judge was kind of black. Gettleman. Gettleman is always a show, whether it's good or bad. Um, There's a couple of nuggets I got out of there from Gettleman. Not much from Judge besides stuff we kind of already thought or knew. Um, what were your overall thoughts on it? Because – Gettleman seemed to, like a little testy, innocent. Like he wasn't as as like happy go lucky as he was as the postseason, as like the end of the season presser. No, January he was bullish. <laughs> you know, January he really did give off the vibe like we we just won twelve games when in fact they won five, and this was more of a. It, I could sense that he was stressed. I mean, you could see him, and I, I'm not a body language expert, and. This is not really going to be like, oh, this is my Giants analysis and this is my Giants take. I'm going to kind of just speak as a fan right now in terms of where I'm at, kind of like I did the start of the show. But 
Gettleman was rubbing his face. I mean, he had his hand, he had his head in his hands sometimes, and he, he just testy with some of the beat reporters. Like I've never heard him as testy as he was with Art Stapleton. When Art Stapleton kind of asked a, a good question, when Dave Gettleman kind of inferred and implied that the Giants were going to put the tag on Leonard Williams, and then Art Stapleton was like, "Well, it's not official yet. Are you saying it's official?" And Dave just like didn't give him an answer, and he was kind of like kind of stern with him. Um, very, very strange when we usually see Dave Gettleman, either he's reserved because he knows that he's on the hot seat or he's bullish because um, things went kind of better than we thought. I could sense his stress and that honestly made me stress as a fan. And I'm not, I am not happy right now with where the Giants are at in terms of their free agency. Now talk to me after the draft and I could be feeling a lot better when you look at things as a whole, but right now, pre-free agency, knowing where the giants are cap wise, knowing that they just put the tag on Leonard Williams. I'm, I'm nervous. It's nervous time for me. Well, this is a weird spot for them because usually this is at the combine and you have the atmosphere of the combine. You're talking about the draft and stuff where this is right before free agency. They haven't, they've done some moves, but they haven't done all of them. And it's like, so everything's speculative. You're not talking about a season that just went, and they've been putting in so much work for this free agency. So I get like, like you said, they are stressed right now. Like this is a stressful time trying to figure out contracts and stuff. And, you know, they still, I'm sure they have an idea of what they want to do with the Solder or Zeitler and, and other, you know, other shorter, smaller contracts. But I view it more as like a, this is like the worst time ever and it's not in its usual atmosphere for a press conference for a general manager right yeah. now. And especially one who is disliked like Dave Gettleman is. Yeah. I, I would have loved if they pushed back this presser for when the cap number was going to be decided because really when the cap number is solidified and you know, we're, we're the, you know, one of the, one of the guys on the beat made a good point today where it's like the cap numbers at 180 right now, it's not going to be jumping up to 190, $190 million. If anything, they have been adding on a couple million here or there, I think as the figure updates, as the off season has gone on. Um, so it's not going to jump to 190. So it's going to be, be like around that supposedly a 183, but really that $3 million can be the difference between Kevin Zeitler being restructured, Kevin Zeitler being released or Kevin Zeitler just being kept, you know, that same contract. So, you know, even though it's not that much of a significant deal of the cap, not being set at, you know, as it is right now, it still is a big deal. And I would have loved for everything to kind of be pushed back. So more cuts can be made more moves pre unrestricted free agency time before all those moves can be made. I would have loved if we just pushed this back. Cause it's like, Whoa, there is still so much that the team has to do before they can literally do anything else because they can't, they can't do anything else because they just put the tag on Leonard Williams, which maybe by the time that you're listening to this, it's going to be official. Yeah, it's, it is official now, but it, it's pre-draft. It's, it's, you know, pre-draft post free agency. It's like, okay, we could talk about things we've done. Whereas right now it's like nothing has changed since the season ended, you know, besides adding, you know, a couple coaches and then yeah. Kyle O'Brien, who we'll, we'll talk about later. So, uh, he, I mean, he was definitely a little more testy. I mean, obviously the run-in with Kim Jones, which we'll talk about. Yeah. Can I say one thing just comparing the way Judge goes about things and the way Gettleman goes about things? And I kind of, I kind of want to hear what you have to say about this. And again, this is, this is a fan. This isn't me like, oh, uh, I'm analyzing the Giants. This is me kind of just speaking as a fan. How Judge goes about like the process and how he talks about the process and how he talks about his attention to detail. I mean, that has shown through since day one, but it clearly is a lot different than Dave Gettleman. And I'm not saying that this makes Dave Gettleman uh, not a smart general manager or a bad general manager or a bad football evaluator, whatever. But, I mean, the proof is in the pudding that mistakes have been made on Gettleman's part, you know, no, most notably 2018. The, the way he went about the process in 2018 was wrong, and that has kind of backtracked the team at least by one year, you would think. But the way that Joe Judge goes about the process, the way that he goes about even just talking about the process in front of the media, I guess this is even more of just a reflection of how much I love Joe Judge, not as much as Dave Gettleman, but it's just so impressive. And I, I really do hope, and I think with the O'Brien hire, he is getting a little bit more power and control. I really do hope they, they give him a little bit more, uh, what's the word, discretion. Because he seems he really he really does seem to have it all under the wraps, which is really cool and it makes me feel good. 
yeah, Judge Judge feels like he's in control, um, and he's never gonna like uh he's never gonna let like a, a press a press you know thing backfire on him. Yeah. Where Gettleman w- like Gettleman Pass. will like Gettleman is gonna like make fun of computer folk like you know or like be like you know make fun of analytics people even though they you know anyways we're even though they do clearly use them yeah yeah um which he was like instead of him being like hey they're not the end all be all like joe judge in that situation like hey analytics aren't the end all be all you know we use them but we use a a combination of many things gettleman is like i'm gonna make fun of those people yeah um well that i think that's the difference between the two of them yeah um all right so let's let's go with gettleman's because there was more to to chew off from dave gettleman i thought the biggest nugget and will it'll lead into kim jones was that he basically said we are fine with letting matt parrott start at right tackle now you know i don't think he had the answer that the way he said though you know because you know jordan you know ron asked him like you know are you comfortable with those guys starting he could have been like yeah but you know we want to have someone out of that in there um whether it's you know bringing somebody out through free agency like he hasn't been like totally like you know last year they said nate Solder struggled like they weren't they didn't lie about that yeah um i thought that was pretty telling of how confident he was and you know, we were talking about it on Monday. The more you think about it, you know, they – Leonard – or Matt Parrott was a, a third-round pick is a, is a pretty decent investment, you yeah. know? So I'm – after today, I'm thinking that Matt Parrott will be the starter week one. Like, they'll get – you know, they'll probably get some kind of vet vet tackle, but the goal will be to have Matt Parrott starting week one, you know? Yeah. Um, I'm, He did go with that argument of – you do, you know, we invest in a third round pick for a reason. And the whole thing of now you can take another tackle in this year's draft and invest in him. And then that's the whole building through the draft type of deal. Right. But you know, Dave Gettleman needs to improve his batting average. That was the thing that was said at the end of 2019. He did in 2020 and Matt Parrott is ultimately a part of that equation of a high leverage draft pick. And is Dave Gettleman going to increase his batting average? You know, that would be a very tough pill to swallow where, if Matt Parrott, regardless of how we felt about the right tackle spot and regardless of how we felt about the offensive line, if the Giants chose to upgrade that spot, that would be a tough pill to swallow to have, hey, that third round pick is now just like a kind of a wasted pick. That would be a tough pill to swallow. So you always want more competition on the offensive line. But at the same time, I, I, do, I do like this answer. I do like it. Like give him a, give him a chance. And Matt Parrott is a big I think his his 2021 is a big indicator of the Giants offensive line as a whole. Like we feel really good about Andrew Thomas and Nick Gates. Um, Shane Lemieux has to, you know, get better, but he was also wasn't a train wreck. You know, there was, there was, there was a few bad reps in the past every game, but at guard, you can get away with those a little bit, you know, um, Kevin Zeitler is a question mark. Um, you know, we don't know what's going to happen at right guard. Hernandez, we know who he is. You know, you can trot him out and feel okay about it. Matt Parrott really is, I think, the indicator of how you view the offensive line next season. How well does he play? And does Andrew Thomas continue his upward path? You know, there hopefully there's no, like, a, you know, he could – like, Andrew Thomas could still start out next season rough, um, even though we don't think he, he will. I don't, we don't think it will be back to the level of 2020. Yeah, and as I've said before, the offensive line gets better if teams don't blitz as – as much as they did in 2020 that's that's inevitable that is inevitable if if the giants and daniel jones if daniel jones is not the highest most blitzed quarterback in the national football league in 2021 the offensive line is going to inevitably get better yep that um yeah do you think that will happen though (laughs) Well, well, that require, and this is, so this is where I did get frustrated. Maybe you all save this for the judge, but this is also just another macro big point. Maybe this will feed right into Kim Jones. Um, Cause I actually do kind of give her a little bit, a little bit of credit. I was not happy with the questions that were asked to judge because it was like, Oh, what did you, what do you think of this specific player? What do you think of this specific coach? It's like, okay, yeah. Joe judge is very good at like talking people up. <laughs> you know, and he's very good at complimenting his guys, which is good, which is fine. I would have loved to hear more about Joe Judge's self-evaluation process. Like we talked about it all the time on the show because we're holding on to Jason Garrett. That's what we're banking on. We're banking on that self-evaluation, self-reflection process. We're banking on that in being 
implemented of, hey, we need to push the ball downfield more, and that will hopefully open up the rest of the offense. Um, so that's what it comes down to. I also think supporters do view that as a losing battle because there no, was they, one really good had, Bobby, question asked about it too. They asked, they asked the question in January. They asked it. And then what Joe Judge said is, follow up with me soon. And they, you know, Dave Gettleman started off his presser, and I'm sure Judge also started off his presser, saying, we finished our evaluation of the roster. Okay, so you finish your evaluation of the roster. Ask the question that you wanted to ask. That was a very good question. You know, I, I think this could easily turn into a very good, a, a small, very good article. Joe Judge's evaluation and self-reflection of the 2020 season. Doesn't matter I, if it came out in January or March. I thought somebody did ask something that was, I thought it was a great question. And he's just like smart, tough, um, you know, um, that fit our culture player. Mm -hmm. Like when the, I don't even know who it was. I think it was a news, like a, it wasn't a newspaper. It was like a, a, you know, a news station. And he's like, when you're looking at wide receivers, not talking about culture, just like ski, like what type of players are you looking for on film? You know, he's like, what, when you're evaluating the wide receiver spot, what type are you looking for? Which was a, I thought it was a great question. It's like, are you looking for that big bodied guy? Are you looking for, you know, the Jalen Waddle type? And he was just like smart, tough, physical. Yeah. And it's like, well, that's not really what we're looking at. Yeah. I, so um, I would have liked to hear just more about what, where do you think the offense went wrong and when, how, and what steps are, do you feel like you can take with your staff to improve it in 2021? Something as simple as that after your self-evaluation process, what are those steps? And I think that maybe could have been a good answer, but he also could have deflected it. And these guys are good at deflecting stuff. Anyway, yeah. that's, 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 that's that. So Ken Jones asked him a very good question. You know, you came in and said, you're going to fix the offensive line. It wasn't good this past year. She cited PFF. Um, and like it was a good, it was a good and fair question. And, you know, I said, we said it on Monday. I think that's my biggest gripe with Dave Gettleman is like, we're entering mm -hmm. year four and it's still a big question mark of the offensive line. And as a whole for 2020, it didn't, we didn't feel good about it. So I thought it was a good question. And then Gettleman was like, they were young. Like he, he was there young because they are young. And then Kim Jones like comes back and was like, you can't say they're, and, and was like, not like was like basically like reprimanding him like you can't say they're young if if kevin zeitler or nate solder on the roster are you saying you're going to keep them and he or you're moving on from them so it's like he's not going to admit even if they are moving on from them he's like no she's like well then you can't say that it's young it's like well you asked about the 2020 offensive line kim jones nate solder wasn't a part of the 2020 offensive line kim jones even though i don't think he would have made it much better like Kim Jones, I can't stand her. I think she's the worst. Um, she's obviously she, ever since the Odell trade, I feel like she's been bitter. And listen, I, like I said, I thought the first question was a good and legit question. The follow up made no sense. Who doesn't think the Giants' offensive line is young? Is there anybody out there who thinks the Giants' offensive line isn't young? I mean, Andrew Thomas was 21 at the end of the season, Shane Lemieux was 23, Nick Gates, 25, first time playing the position. Like Cam Fleming was, you know, He's looking at a vet. He was 28 years old. And the only one was Kevin Zeitler, who was 30 years, 30 years old. And Kevin Zeitler is good. So I, I just, it was just so, it was such a weird thing for her to like fire off like that. I give her credit. I really do. Cause also if you think about it, she's the national media member, right? She's not a part of a, a local affiliate. I mean, I guess for the NFL network, she does jets and giant stuff. I don't know what her, what her specific role is. So I think she can do that. You know, it's like, oh, well, you know, why do I care if Dave Gettleman doesn't like me? I have the backing of like the NFL network. So I, I give her credit for standing her ground. What, <laughs> and it's tough to stand your ground when you're in the moment. You know, a lot of people like to, you know, they, they maybe like to talk about how they're tough, but she stood her ground in the moment. It was just a bad second question. It was stupid. It was I a bad second sucks. question. Every time she, her questions almost always suck. Well, no, she, she caught, she honestly, she had a point to, you know, backfire in a way, but she could have really turned it to, well, Dave, the reason why the offensive line is so young is because it took you three years to actually get pieces in here that made sense. She Nate Solder, right. She did not say that, but she should have said that. And I think when she quote tweeted herself to try to clarify it, that's the direction where she was going. And it's, well, it's like, well, Dave, you signed Patrick Omame uh, for a, to a three-year deal when that wasn't very smart. You signed Nate Solder and you backloaded his contract. I found it to be very funny that, that Dave Gettleman talked today about the negative effects of backloading contracts. Well, I guess he learned that from Nate Solder. So he made all these mistakes. They, they invested in, did, did they keep Eric Flowers for Dave Gettleman's first year and they put, tried to put him at right tackle? Yeah. 
Yeah. So even, you know, even doing that as well and not getting his ass out of here, because clearly that wasn't going to work. So all of those things costed the Giants one year, two years. Nate Solder is still kicking us in the ass. So I think from that point of view, Kim Jones had an awesome point. It's like, yeah, fight back on Dave Gettleman about the offensive line. Like there, he's saying it's young, but it's also taken him four years for it to actually get young. Yeah. Say that though. Bump like, yeah. You can't say that it's young if Nate Solder's on the on the road. It's like, well, you asked about the performance of the 2020 offensive line, which Nate Solder wasn't a part of. Like she, she. I mean, listen. I if there's no reason, like Dave Dillon has not given you enough reason to like what he's done. Like that's 100 fair. But I mean, we all know it stems from the Odell trade. I mean, it's 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 been clear ever since that, and even not even with Gettleman, like Shermer. When like asked about Josh Allen, when Josh Allen like like you know how what was your evaluation of Josh Allen and through the drafts like we thought he had a chance to be a starter and like turned that into like some huge like Pat Shermer's just crapping down Josh Allen, crapping about Josh Allen. It's like what were you supposed to say? Like oh uh, we full bloom loved him. We thought he was the franchise QB. We didn't draft him though. <laughs> like uh, Kim Jones to me is this the absolute worst. I can't stand her. Good for Kim Jones. That's all I got to say. Good for her. Girl power. She sucks. Um, Kim Jones, Matt Lombardo, Pat Leonard. And then, and that was, you know, that might have dealt with Gettleman's mood. It's like, because Gettleman, like, Gettleman clapped back and he was right. He's like, when your left tackle's 21, your left guard is a rookie, and your center is basically a rookie, the offensive line is young. He did and, say, I love how he did say his left guard. Left guard. Not, not his part time left guard. Left guard. Um, and then, then the guy who runs it's like Pat Leonard. It's like, oh god, <laughs> it's just like a brutal, like. Uh, and then the one person, which, well, screw it. We can talk about the restructure backload thing. We can get into like the the you know the funny parts of it. The one guy's just like, can I call you an old GM? Or it's like, that's a weird question. Like, he, I, so- I- he sounded like he was fourteen. That guy, by the way. I think wasn't that hey, Steve hey, Servi? Hey Dave, can I call you an old GM? And Dave's like, "What? What? <laughs> Why would you ask me that?" Um, I mean, I, I, I was, it was weird. Like some of the, it was, like you said, it was a one of the more weird Dave Gettleman press conferences. Yes. Yeah. Um, it's like you get an old GM. Can I call you old? Where it's like you know you can. You know, Gettleman's like, it's like, okay, if that makes you happy, it's like, what is, what are we getting? At I here? did feel bad for him in that moment because now I don't feel bad that he's been crapped on be, for being a bad GM, right? I mean, all right, let me, let, or before you get your panties tied up in a wad that I call Dave Gettleman a bad GM, but you know, I don't feel bad for Dave Gettleman for all the flack that he gets for having a terrible record as a GM. How about that? Do you like that spin? Um, I did feel bad for him in that moment where it's like this dude has just been made fun of so much that. He's like, yeah, if, if you want to make fun of my age, like, sure. If that if that makes you happy, go right ahead. Because he um, is a punching bag for, like, the – it's it's he, like you said. I mean, he, he deserves it. I mean, th- Yeah, but it's not because team. of his moves. People make people are making fun of him, not his moves. Yeah. Like, like he and, – and he plays into that, too. You know, he, like, yeah. he has fun with it. Um, um, in terms of backloading stuff, I want to get your opinions on this. I've been giving my opinions on a lot of things this episode. I think – this is kind of like the perfect year to backload stuff. Now, I don't think that there's a global pandemic coming up anytime soon, at least another one after this. So look at what the Cowboys just did with Dak Prescott. I mean, Dak Prescott just got an insane jaw dropping, you know, second, arguably the greatest contract of all time. Um, you know, you could say Patrick Mahomes is the greatest contract of all time, but what is that? That, that deals a decade. So he's that like, he's set. But Dak, you know, Dak Prescott, what is this? Basically, it's basically a four-year deal. The last two years can be voided somehow. Dak Prescott can be a free agent again when he's 31 years old and possibly get more money. So I think for him, player-wise, it's like the best deal ever. But this year, the cap hit is lower. It's not that big. It's it's like, what is it? Uh, some $20 million cap hit, probably somewhere in the middle there. And then I'm sure it's backloaded from there. So is, is this not the perfect year to backload a contract, even just slightly? I think he Fair. was just saying it's more of his philosophy and you don't want to get caught doing that too much, you know, because he's Correct. like some GMs just do it all the time. So I don't think that signals like, oh, they're they were not willing to restructure with Kevin Seidler. 
Um, well, I, hope they, I hope they don't restructure with Solder. Yeah, I mean, but they might be forced to, you know, and I was like, you know, yeah. I, I think he was more speaking of like, you don't want to get too caught up into that because eventually it catches up with you. Which it did um, for Nate Solder. Right. <laughs> Nate Solder opting out really did screw us. Anyways. It, we, we said it. We said it when it happened. I mean, it did lead to Logan Ryan. It did lead to some, it, I mean, Logan Ryan's a really good piece of this team. Um, but now we knew that this was really going to bite us in the ass. Um, sins from 2018, still living on. Um, let's see. He did say something about like, you know, because of some guys haven't played 20 months, you might move back into the 2022 draft. Uh, I don't see that happening. One, Gettleman doesn't has never traded back. And two, he is on the hot seat. So I don't see him doing that. Like, I just, I just don't see it, especially when they only have six picks. He's like, oh, we may move up. I mean, and if they, <laughs> if they like move back from like 11 to like 17 and they got a, like a 2022 third round pick, yeah, I could see something like that. But I don't see him like moving out of this first round for a uh, next year, first round pick next year or anything like that. You know, they're going to move up, Bobby. <laughs> yeah um <laughs> would, would i actually would be really surprised at that um funny moments um let's see i i actually have some clips i will say we were talking about how ju- you know people make fun of gettleman a little too much this was embarrassing like this wasn't like oh you know funny gettleman this to me was kind of embarrassing i mean one of them one of them was um it was uh cheese and crackers it was uh the inside linebacker um from Georgia, Tate Crawford, uh, and um, one of them was Chris Williamson, who was on the practice squad. So, and the other guy, I'm not sure of. It wasn't Cam Brown. Cam Brown was a sixth. But the point is, those. It took him nine seconds, and then it doesn't do Tate Crowder, Tate Crawford. Um, Chris Williamson isn't even on the football team. He's a, yeah, he was like a practice squad guy, and then it's like, like you should that those answers should come to you pretty <laughs> easy. I was. That was, you know, like I said, people people bash, you know, Gettleman for his Gettlemanisms. That one to me was a little bit embarrassing. I'll give him the Sean Lemieux one. Yeah, that one's fine. Like, that's I'll that's an that accent. One. That's yeah. an accent thing. At least I got, I'm, I'm, I'm doubt, I'm, God, I hope so. But now I'm doubting it. But come on. Like, I don't care even if he's like the 53rd guy on the roster. You should know your draft picks. You should know your players. <laughs> Tay Crawford. You know, you realize he's never going to be called Tay Crowder again. Um, Jeez. The Windows one. Um, do I have a clip of the that? There wasn't a ton of good, uh, a ton of good drops. Doing Windows, yes. Yeah, we're doing Windows. I, I don't, you know, Microsoft Windows is nice, but I, I'm not a Window Theory guy. I'm just not. That was in reference to. Um, do, you do you feel, feel the pressure to win under? Uh, Daniel Jones rookie contract. Yes, he's not gonna. He's not gonna be like, yeah, actually, we gotta get this done in three years. All we're screwed. No, I mean, like, I would have. I would have liked for him to say, yeah. I mean, there there is a window of where you don't have to pay your quarterback a lot of money. I would have liked that answer. Um, I don't think there's anything wrong with that. I think most GMs would be willing to say that. Like, yes, you should want to win before you have to pay your quarterback and your good players a lot of money. I would have liked that. Um. That one didn't bother me. All right, so that's that's all I've got on Gettleman. You want to move on to Judge real quick? Yeah, let's move on to Judge. Now, the the things I liked, he said, like we're doing league studies and we're pres- like we're having coaches present things, which I've always said, like if you're if you're an, a coach in the NFL, and if you're not going and watching stuff from other teams and stealing stuff from them, you're a bad coach. Like you yep. are a flat out bad coach if you if you're not doing that. Um, so I like that, and you know, stealing stuff from the college game. I thought those. Those are two very interesting points, and it's something I've expected out of those guys, and and we've seen it with the way Patrick Graham has called his defense. Um, and then he had the passing league quote. I want to I want to do the passing league quote because he was actually more talking about um, the Giants' defense in the draft. Well, look, it's a passing league. I mean, truly, it is. I mean, the, you have to be able to stop the run to be effective on defense. But when you look at the guys getting paid the most money, it's obviously the quarterbacks. It's a passing league. So when you talk about the pass rush, it, it can never be just one player. You have to have depth in that, those positions, and it has to come from multiple areas. So to me, the improvement of the pass rush as you know the year went on last year was a combination of uh, the improvement made up front with the defensive line, the outside linebackers in our pass rush games. 
and then also on the back end with the way the defensive backs improved and the coverage on the back end to give them more time to get to the quarterback. You know, nothing really happens independently of each other. If the coverage isn't sound, you can't have a pass rush. You know, if the pass rush isn't sound, they got to cover for a long time, and all of a sudden that ends up not being really in your favor. So really I saw the improvement of the defense as a whole, and that's what we have to really go ahead and keep emphasizing is making sure that all three levels, the DBs, the linebackers, and the defensive line, continue to improve within our schemes, and then we have to make sure that we use guys. So a uh, bunch of nothing answers after that. Um, but essentially talking about what their defense was and what it really was. It's like, hey, our, we trust our defensive line to stop the run, and our linebackers and DBs are focused on the pass. Um, and we've seen they do innovative stuff, whether it's bringing a safety down to fit in the run game, you know, using their corners in the run game, um, you know, where it's, it's – and, you know, within uh, what Mark Schofield just did a wrote an article about some stuff and the Giants were doing a ton of it um, of how to stop the big play in the passing game. And I, you know, that's what um, Judge was talking about. He was like, hey, like we you got to have someone people who can get to the quarterback. It's how, it's not even just how the Giants defense operates. I think it's how any good defense operates, really, in the NFL today. I mean, I've talked about it time and time again. You know, you're you have quarterbacks that are mostly averaging releasing the ball in the range of 2.6 seconds to 2.7 seconds, their time to throw. It's not even their time in the pocket, which your time to throw is usually more than your time in the pocket because if you have plays where you're scrambling, you're improvising, yada, yada, yada. So your time to throw is between 2.6 and 2.7 seconds on average. So how do you expect when you have pretty good, decent offensive linemen in front of you too, you know, pro caliber offensive linemen in front of you, how do you expect your edge rushers and your pass rushers and your defensive line to get there consistently and to get home consistently in 2.6 and 2.7 seconds. The way that you expect them to get home consistently is when you have good coverage on the back end. And of course, you know, judge is never going to come out and say, yeah, the coverage on the back end is more important than the pass rush. But the fact that he emphasized it so much is a thing that I like. And it clearly is the thing that Graham values clearly is the thing that judge values. And it's clearly the reason why the defense was successful this year. And the reason why they weren't successful under James Betcher because their coverage was so bad because they were allowing explosive plays. So it didn't even allow the pass rush to have any opportunity where the quarterback's holding onto the ball for slightly above average time. Yeah. Uh, and that's the way the NFL is moving is, you know, like the elite pass. I, I, I still do think an elite pass rusher is more uh, valuable than an elite corner. Um, but like the league is like, Hey, you can't have elite players at every position, you know, elite pass rushers and elite corners are both hard to come by. Yeah. It's like, Hey, like we're not going to consistently get to the QB, um, especially in the playoffs where offensive lines are, are probably a little better. So we need to, you know, we need to give our guys a chance and, and really work on the coverage. And that's what, that's just the way the NFL is moving. Now, Joe judge, move that to your offense. Let's let's turn our offense into it's a passing league. That's that that would be my critique. Let's turn our offense into it's a passing league. You know I agree, but a lot of people, oh, Saquon's back. It's it's giving the ball 23, 24, 25 times a game. Saquon which... should be so mu- used so much in the receiving game. And I was I you know I was doing my running back preview video on free agency. You know in week 1 Saquon had more receiving yards than any Giants running back had all, like combined had yeah. for a, a single game. Yeah. I was blown away. It's not like, you know, been one thing if Saquon had like 160 receiving yards or 100 plus, and it's like, okay, well, you know, that might have ended up being his best night of the year. I thought that was pretty interesting. They have to – Saquon has to be such a big part of the passing game and not just check downs. Like, this play is designed to go to Saquon. So, yeah. I mean, and that just – and that makes it easier for when you do hand it off to the kid. He's going to be able to – not just have the big runs, but to get those consistent four, five, six yard carries too, you know, where it's like, I don't want to, I don't want to remove the mindset from Saquon to have big plays. I want to make it to where you can have that mindset and still get those five, six yard plays. Like I don't want him. I don't want Saquon to have Wayne Gallman's mindset. No, no, I, I agree that that is where hope. <laughs> Maybe it's going to be a blessing and a curse that he's not as explosive when he comes back from his ACL injury, at least in the first year. The second year, I think he's going to be like back. Um, but the first year, he may not be as explosive. So he may have to force himself to go through that mental change of more often than not, I need to take what is in front of me, which in a way, this Jason Garrett offense is centered around taking it, taking what is in front of you and sustaining long, long, exhausting, boring drives. 
Um, Should we take a break? Do you want to take a break or do you just want to move on? Well, let's take a break, but we have um, we have something well, to read. You know what? Uh, we, we are going to take a break. You want to know why, Justin? Why? Because it's that time of year again. Conference tournaments are tipping off. Bubble teams are making their final push for a bid, while the top seeds are preparing for what they hope is a long run. DraftKings Sportsbook, America's top-rated sportsbook app, is putting new customers in the center of the action. Bet $4 on an underdog and win $256 if they win. It's that simple. Simple Man Radio. That's bet $4 on an underdog and, and select college basketball games, if, and if they win, you collect $256. The bank is open. Bank shot. Pick one of many uh, select college basketball underdogs for your shot at winning $256. All it takes is a $4 bet. There's no better way to put your college basketball knowledge to the test than to put your money where your mouth is with DraftKings Sportsbook. Don't worry if college basketball isn't for you. DraftKings Sportsbook offers great odds and promotions on golf, hockey, and so much more. DraftKings is safe, secure, and reliable, so you can deposit and withdraw your funds at your convenience. Download the top-rated DraftKings Sportsbook app now and use promo code JOHNBOY when you sign up to turn $4 into $256. If the underdog of your choosing pulls off the upset, that's code JOHNBOY to turn $4 into $256 for a limited time. Only at DraftKings Sportsbook. Must be 21 or older. New Jersey, Indiana, or Pennsylvania only. New customers only. Restrictions apply. See DraftKings.com slash Sportsbook for detail. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER or in Indiana. 1-800-9-WITH-IT. All right, so Which we're gonna do a talking giants um, tourney thing. Where well, I was thinking first place um, gets a shirt, mm-hmm. second place gets a coffee mug, and third place gets stickers. Nice mugs we got. Our mugs are really awesome. You know, I don't, I don't, um, I don't front on that type of stuff, but I do think our mugs are pretty awesome. Sip, gurgle. Go, 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 Cheers. Um, Leonard Williams. Leonard Williams. Franchise tag, $19.35 million. All the reports are saying that they're going to get a long-term deal done. This is just kind of a placeholder. So um, that's pretty interesting. I don't see him settling for anything less than a 19 mil a year average annual value. <laughs> um. I, I don't think we knew Leonard Williams was going to get tagged, but I think me and you both were pretty confident Leonard Williams was going to be a part of this Giants team. Yeah, I we certainly hoped that a long term deal would be done, but also why not? I mean, if you, if you're Leonard Williams' agent, oh my god! I mean, it, Leonard He's Williams in the best situation ever. <laughs> Leonard Williams could be swimming in uh, Puerto. Where was he? Puerto Rico, Costa Rica, Puerto Rico. Puerto Rico. You could be swimming in Puerto Rico and Gigantes. he can just be having a ball of fun because he knows that the Giants have screwed themselves. Um, and why not? I mean, of course, we were hoping and we were rooting for a long term extension being, you know, done before. But I think we knew, you know, I think I you know not only because I have a personal bias to Leonard Williams. But I think we also just knew because of what the Giants did to acquire him and then to also keep him for the 2020 season that there was very little chance that he was just going to walk um, and just, okay, bye, see you later. Um, <laughs> so I have something to say um, about the value of Leonard Williams. Now, of course, is he worth $19, $20 million? You know what? Probably not, Bobby. Can you replace Leonard Williams? Uh, yeah, you can literally replace any player, um, you know, even quarterback, unless if, unless you have an absolutely elite quarterback. Yes, is every position kind of replaceable? Yes, you can make that argument, okay? But Leonard Williams is a good football player, and I even think throughout his eight games in 2019, he proved that he is a good football player, and he deserves to be paid. Would $19, $20 million be overpaying? Yes, but this is what happens when you re-sign players who are coming out of their rookie deals, which Leonard Williams is. ESPN um, Stats and Analytics released a new metric today. That metric is called um, expected sacks. So you know I love expected completion percentage. You know I love uh, rushing yards over expected. So what this stat and metric measures is what position these uh, edge rushers, defensive linemen, uh, front seven guys play, what positions they play, the double team rate down in distance, a sack on a third and 19 isn't going to mean as much compared to a third and five or a first and 10, right? 
um, what the season sack rate of the quarterback he facing was. Um, a, a sack on Drew Brees where he gets rid of the ball very quickly is more valuable than a sack on Daniel Jones on third down since the offensive line was bad and the Giants are a very highly blitzed team. Um, what the teammates are doing around him. So the, the how often the teammates are winning. So all of that stuff, you know, I, I may make a video on that, on that metric and stuff like that. I'm going to, I'm going to have a lot of fun with it. So they did, they, they talked about Leonard Williams in the, in the initial article, no double digit sack player had fewer expected sacks. It is a reason to be more bullish on Leonard Williams's future. Meaning Leonard Williams had a single digit. I believe the number was six and a half expected sacks this season. He got 11 and a half sacks based upon the production of his teammates around him, his own double team rate, and the position that he plays. He's good. So is he the best pass rusher in the NFL with those numbers? I, I don't think you can make that I conclusion. Know. Oh. I, I'm joking, but here's <laughs> something. Because, you know, obviously there's always talking points. Um, and it's like, well, Leonard Williams, he's only had one good year. One Pitt, that's such a horrible take. It's not true. Like, the last year's half-sack year was the anomaly. He's gotten sacks. Now, like I said, this year was a career year, um, you know, whether it's QB hits. But um, I remember bringing up these stats when the Giants traded for Leonard Williams. So when this is only when he was with the Jets. Um, and I, I got these – I remember PFF. Um, I still hate you, PFF. But they can – like, PFF can track numbers. You know, it's not going to use their grades. But they can track numbers. So when the Giants traded for him, tackles for a loss among uh, among interior defenders since 2016. He had 43. That was third highest in the NFL. And this and basically first for all these categories was Aaron Donald. Run stops among interior defenders. Third, 97. Um, and then percent of run tackles have gone for a loss or known gain. Second at 38.7%. Leonard Williams was really good before this. He just didn't live up to his draft slot for the Jets as a top five pick. Which, you know, you get drafted there, you're expected to beat Aaron Donald. That's the way he was talking about coming on the draft. And he, his sacks fluctuated a little more. So this idea that Leonard Williams just got good this year, to me, is ridiculous. And like, oh, well, it's just a contract year. It's like, you know who else was a contract year? 2019 was a contract year for Leonard Williams, and he had a half a sack. And then also it's like, well, Dalvin Thomason is the one to make him good. Dalvin Thomason, and this was a talking point we had last year in 2019, or maybe, I don't know if you did, but me and Danny did, is Dalvin Thomason took off. Dalvin Thomason started being like a highlight of our defensive film like studies when Leonard Williams came in. Leonard Williams unlocked Dalvin Thomason more than Dalvin Thomason unlocked Leonard Williams. Now, does Leonard um, benefit from having Dexter Lawrence and Dalvin and, you know, and, and having Blake Martinez and a good uh, DBs behind him? Yes, but guess what? He's going to have all that, and He's much harder to replace than what Dalvin Thomason does. Doesn't mean you're going to get some, doesn't mean you're up. Oh, we're just going to get an easy replacement for Dalvin Thomason. But Leonard Williams is so much more important than Dalvin Thomason. Yeah. That's what it comes down to, Bobby. That That's really what it comes down to is the fact that Leonard Williams is harder to replace than Dalvin Thomason. I think if you're, you know, just saying this from a Jets standpoint, if you're going goo goo gaga over Quinn and Williams right now, let's just say, Quentin Williams is one of the most was one of the best run defenders in the National Football League. I don't know how he is as a as a pass rusher. I don't think he produces in that regard. So the same people that maybe want to talk about how good Quentin Williams is and Quentin Williams oh, sucked last year. Last year meaning 2019? 2019, yeah, sorry. Okay. So I mean that was also his rookie year, I'm pretty sure. So Right. Um neither here nor there. You have to overpay for good football players that produce. And even if Leonard Williams in your brain only produced for one year, he did produce. Um, and you can't let that production walk out the door knowing what the Giants have at edge. <laughs> what what are they – who is going to get to the quarterback if Leonard Williams doesn't this year? You can – Bobby, I know you can answer with, oh, you know, maybe have a combination of Kyle Van Noy and Dalvin Tomlinson. Uh, Kyle Van Noy has never even put up close – Nowhere even near the stratosphere of what Leonard Williams did in 2020. Nowhere, ever. No, but I could see the argument of keeping Dalvin and Kyle Van Noy, like those two working together, and also being like, you know, we don't expect Leonard to have 11 and a half sacks yeah. every then you're, year. Then you're talking, so like, I mean, say you're expecting that eight. Like you, Kyle Van Noy and Dalvin Thomason will can both put up eight together. You know, I mean, but then you're you're talking about 
really relying on your back end, like really relying on your back end, because it's, it's not just a matter of, okay, Leonard Williams may get coverage sacks, but guess what? He'll eventually beat his guy. Kind of tough to do, even in the NFL. D- d- point to me, the Giants player that cover sack is the worst term in the NFL. Right which now. we've we've talked about that. Let's we've watch everybody who gets double digit sacks. Watch. Let's go through every single one of them. Yeah. It's the worst term in the NFL right now. Is cover sacks. It's it's the most annoying thing in the world because the but, NFL is turning into coverage sacks. Which I pointed. I I literally laid out the reason why. The NFL is turning into coverage sacks earlier in the show because quarterbacks have the tendency to release the ball very quickly. And when they don't, that is when your pass rush has to produce and get home. But, you know, we've we've had an offseason. We've had a year full of why Leonard Williams only important. gets coverage sacks. Like we had the worst coverage in the NFL. So bravo to him that every time the coverage was halfway decent, he got a sack. Yeah. Um, now, what sucks with Leonard Williams and the, and the real criticism is he had all the bargaining power in the world. Gettleman trading for him midseason did screw the gen- one forget even get the draft picks you lost all leverage and a year where he had a half a sack and you could have gotten Leonard Williams on a much more affordable deal than this yeah if they just signed him in free agency there's you know they probably get him for you know 11 12 mil you know max um and now we're talking about 20 mil so that's where you know there is a very real criticism of Gettleman for that is they gave Leonard Williams so much bargaining power when he had his worst statistical year, even though he's still a good player. And then now he has his best season. It's like, well, obviously now he has all, you know, he has even that much more bargaining power. Yeah. And like you said, you can't let that kind that player go. Yeah. Um, so. Stinks. It's a, it's the Nate Solar situation is a lose-lose situation. Kevin Zeitler situation is a lose-lose situation. And unless Leonard Williams can continue the production that he put up in 2020 or somewhat similar to it, that will also be a lose lose situation. Well, if, if Leonard Williams has seven sacks, it's regression. No, people, don't, that's another word that gets used totally wrong regression. Well, it's, uh, it, it, what, if you have seven and a half sacks or seven sacks after coming off an 11 and sack, 11 and a half sack season, but you have a similar number of QB hits and pressures, it's not regression. No, you are continuing having worse stats from one year to the next isn't regression. Okay. Is he, is it worse as a player or the, Anyways, well, no, no regression. I think regression is player performance. And sure, even if he, let's say, even if he gets 25 QB hits and three sacks, do I count that as a down year? Yes, because if you're going to get paid this money, you need to get home. But if it's a difference between yeah. seven sacks and 11 sacks, but you're still putting up the consistent pressure, I mean, look at what Shaq Barrett did this year. Shaq Barrett had nowhere near the sack total that he had this year, but Giants fans would be willing to pay a, a mountain, you know anything to get Shaq Barrett on this football team, but his Two production, good years for Shaq. Barrett. <laughs> it, but his, but his production was very different this year compared to 2019. So it's just very backwards. People, people like to hate on out. It, it is, it's a terrible situation, but hate on the Leonard Williams trade and deal and situation for the right reasons, not for the wrong reasons, because a lot of people are saying the wrong reasons. Right. All right. Um, let's, we, we're at 48 minutes. So let's, let's get through the rest of this news. Yeah. Um, Levine Toy Lolo restructured from 2.95 mil to 1.6 mil, which, you know, saves the, um, you know, 1.35 mil, um, 650,000 of it is guaranteed. I was blown away at the reaction to this. Like people are like, this guy barely plays like you, we run three tight end sets, the second most in the NFL. Yep. 20 people are like you only plays 27% of the snaps. Like you realize how much that is for a third tight end. And they did a lot of two tight end sets with just him and Caden Smith. Levine Toilolo is a good blocker. Now he's not like a you know, he's not Trent Williams out there, but he's a good blocker. And you're like you're not gonna find a better one for him in free agency for the minimum. If you want to save, if like I couldn't believe the 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 outrage over this. We're talking about six hundred thousand dollars. It's not stopping the Giants from doing anything. Does this also mean? That so six hundred fifty thousand dollars of the new deal is guaranteed, right? Yeah. And then he signed for what's the new total? One point six mil. So would the Giants save one million dollars if they were to cut him right uh, tomorrow? I think so. Yeah. So the Giants can still cut him and additionally save one million dollars with only a six hundred thousand dollar cap hit. Now that's at least how I think it works. 
as of you know as of right now from what we're hearing you know the guaranteed money is what you're guaranteed and if you're and that you're automatically given that and then the rest of your cap hit is if you live out the extent of that deal so somebody has to who, be the third tight end yeah and i'm not gonna be mad that they spent six hundred thousand dollars more than the minimum when they actually use it like they use their third tight end a lot right a lot like of people 27 pointing... of the snaps for third tight end is a lot yeah a we lot do of it the people... second most in the nfl a lot of people were pointing to the fact that he only had like what five catches this past year um, yeah i mean that's not what he's brought in like that was like i don't i didn't i could care less if he had one catch yeah um his, his catches weren't even like they were just they were purely scheme you know where he's left open yeah um and and he becomes even more valuable because saquon's a guy you do want to get on the outside where gallman and morris weren't um so he even becomes more valuable so um i mean when i first saw that i was like oh this is great news and then i was like wait people are mad. like why are people mad at this I think we said at one point on this show that we were expecting him to get cut and it was kind of clear cut and it was kind of clear cut, no pun intended, that he was going to be released. Well, we knew he wasn't going to play at that contract. Right. Correct. Which if correct, they kept correct, him correct. at three mil a year, it's like, okay, that's a lo- like that's too much of a luxury. Which yeah. I didn't think that because of the kind of low contract to begin with, I didn't think that they would restructure. I thought they would just flat out cut him. But now looking at oh, it's it's there's literally such minimal, minimal risk of keeping Levine Toy Lolo on the team. I mean, I mean, odds are if they draft a player or if they go out and they sign another, like, oh, here's this random tight end that we don't know about and we have to look into and we're gonna get overly excited for. Um I would rather have this where yeah, I don't want to pick a six round like we shouldn't go into the six round and be like we need to get our third string tight like we know what you do in the sixth round get whichever player we think is the best yeah not so. trying to fill a need you know and it's like people like six round tight ends you know what they usually turn into worse than levine toy lolo it's like yeah <laughs> you know so um and the same goes with backup qbs like we'll develop a six round qb it's like like you know six round qbs they're lucky to turn into colt mccoy um the Giants cut Cody Core two mil. Um, doesn't save two mil because of the whole you know top fifty one rule. Um, so it saves about like one point three mil. But uh, I think me and you have a similar mindset. I got no use for wide receivers that are only special teams guys, unless they're the greatest special teams player of all time. And it's coming back from an injury too. So I, there is they are supposedly like looking to bring him back in the camp if they can get him on a minimum. So there's that. Uh, but paying him two million a year to me, that you know that that was that was one. If they like, if they kept Cody Core, been like, what's the point of this? You know, is he that good on special teams coming back from a torn ACL? Which please don't bring back Nate Ebner either. Opens up number seventeen for um, Jalen Waddle. Let's make it happen, baby. Jalen Waddle had like the fastest forty time I think out of all the forty times. And they also did a uh, wait. I I, uh, I bookmarked this. This is from, I, I love the GPS data because, yeah, you know, a lot of people that, you know, oh, the 40 yard dash doesn't mean anything. Dave Guttel even, even dropped the line of uh, what, uh, Olympics and underwear today? Underwear uh, he, Olympics. Underwear Olympics. So when he was talking about the combine. So GPS data, next gen data, which tracks, you know, player tracking data when players are in pads, which is what people care about, right? Um, Alabama Jalen Waddell uh, posted the best play speed of any wide receiver in the country this year. There you go. Speed kills, baby. What other cuts were made? There was one more. That was it for cuts. But we did hire Kyle O'Brien. Ah. Hired Kyle O'Brien. Uh, they made a new role from the senior personnel executive. I'll go through his resume real quick. Spent the last five years with the Lions, one year as, as um, player personnel in 2016, and then the last four years as the vice president of player personnel. He was with the Jags from 2013 to 15, director of college scouting, the Chiefs in 2012 as a scout, and then he was with the Patriots for from 2002 to 2011 doing a, a bunch of things. So no crossover with anybody on the Giants staff or anybody, but an interesting hire. You know, the Lions let go of him. They felt the need to bring him in. It's something I do like about Judge, though, is he almost feels – now, I want to pump the brakes a little bit on comparisons, but you know how, like, Nick Saban is, like, coaches that are looking for, like, a new start – you know, it's like where they were once well-renowned people and 
they go to Alabama and kind of get their stuff back on track and get head coaching jobs. Kind of feels like Joe Judge is like that. He's like, just come come coach here. We'll find a role for you, whether it's Jeremy Pruitt, whoever. Yeah, Pruitt. That's Pat Flaherty. Like, we'll, we'll find a role for you. We'll let Hitchens. you be part of it. And um, and 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 then go on. So Garrett, um, <laughs> shush, shush, shush up, Nancy. Um, now he did uh, was a part of drafting Kenny Galladay and Allen Robinson. How about that? How about that? And Gerard Davis, who I think is actually maybe a, a good linebacker uh, uh, free agency acqu- uh, acquisition if you can get him for the right money. Uh, and he's a Harvard guy. God, Harvard. To Harvard. We want to get smart people in the building. Um, the most interesting thing about this hire, well, there's two things that I have. The Giants just keep on creating positions for people, and I love it. Is there is there a cap to like how many people you can have on a nope. coaching staff? No, nope. I don't think so. How come we've never done this before with bringing in people? Because we never had Joe Judge before. I mean, I'm sure Coughlin did. I'm, I'm, I, I didn't, you know, I definitely was not following the team as religiously as I am right now, you know, with Coughlin. But I definitely know for a fact under McAdoo, definitely Shermer. Sher- Shermer never brought in like all these people. Shermer probably didn't even have the league connections. Um, Shermer like brought in nobody in year two, which is bizarre <laughs> for especially for his defense. Um, the second thing is Kyle O'Brien has never worked for the Giants in his 19-year career. But obviously, he's worked with Judge before. I mean, that's the obvious thing. He hasn't worked for Judge. He has not? No, they didn't cross over in New England. They did not cross? I thought they were – I thought they – I thought they evaluated talent together in New England. No. He he, Judge came in in 2012. Oh. And then he left New England in 2011. So he has no connection with anybody, really, besides Mike Francesa. Because he looks like him and he has the same hair. He does have good hair. Um, but his like his either his father or his grandfather was like a frequent guest of the Mike and the Mad Dog show. Oh, well, his grandfather. Which I watched that 30 for 30 last night. Here's the connection to the Giants. His grandfather was like a tr- was like a trainer or a doctor for the team. That's the connection. Yeah, yeah, that's what it was. So um, but I I don't consider that to be like a oh, this guy's a giant guy. I do think he's more of a Joe Judge guy. I mean, just because of the Patriots, rather than like a Giants, a ties with the Giants guy. Would you say that that's true? Yeah, yeah. I, and I, I think definitely that's significant. Think Judge probably rang Belichick's line and 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 asked some questions about him. Um. So yeah, I, I, this is a this is kind of a why not thing. I'm, we're not going to give some crazy analysis and go through each draft and be like, this is you know, this is the one because you know what we do would be like these are like. He's all for the Kenny Galladay and Allen Robinson, but he didn't. Th- How involved was he in this bad pick? Um, no, so. no, but it, it is significant when you're thinking about, again, power structure within the organization. You know, how much sway is Joe Judge having? You know, p- creating all these different positions um, and now even bringing in a front, a guy that he probably has more ties with than, than Dave Gettleman and – the fact that this is a front office position, I think that's 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 big. In terms of the sway that he has within the organization, Judge. Yeah, we all. I, I just I don't know enough to say that. Um. Well, I do. All right, all right, Mister Insider. Um, you know these contracts they they're hard to figure out. All right. <laughs> oh, and they also hired Drew Wilson from Colorado as an assistant strength and conditioning coach. Colorado players in the draft defensive tackle Mustafa Johnson. Great, great name, honestly. And mm. wide receiver KD Nixon. Um, Mufasa. So, so keep keep an eye on those two names. KD Nixon is probably more of an undrafted free agent guy. And then Mustafa. That's I mean, that's that's an amazing name. Um, so check, check, so keep your eye out for those two guys. That's it. Done. That's it. Let's keep this episode under now. We appreciate you guys. We'll be back on Friday for whatever news happens. And our f- Madden Twitter GM free agency plans, which I'm sure everyone will pick apart, but well, I'll pick you. Freaking Are we apart. doing that on Friday or do we have to push that to Monday because we just don't know what's going to happen? We're doing it on Friday. Oh boy. We're not having an episode on Monday. <sighs> doing it, We're doing it live. Just don't take it too serious. Um, just be like, this is more of, this is an idea of what I want to do. All right. Appreciate you guys. See you on Friday until then. Let's go big blue.